Welcome to All About Hopkinton, the HCAM original program highlighting the people and organizations that make Hopkinton a great place to live. I'm Mary Arnott, your host. Today we have with us Bill Shaw of the Hopkinton Historical Society. Welcome, Bill. Glad you could be on the show today. Thank you, Mary. It's great to be here. Before we get in and actually talk about the Historical Society itself and the wonderful things that happen there, I wanted to ask you a little bit about yourself and your background. So tell us how maybe how long you've been in Hopkinton or how you got involved with this, whatever you want to share with us. Sure. Um, well, um, my training is as a psychologist and I've, I've now just doing research in uh, pain and disability. So that's the kind of what I do when I'm not working with the Historical Society. And uh, about 10 years ago, uh, uh, we came here and, and I actually work for a local employer. Mm -hmm. And uh, we just love the look of Hopkinton. And we um, bought a house that was built in 1750. And I think that's what kind of launched us into our interest in local history and the Hopkinton Historical Society. That's wonderful. I happen to be a psych major myself, but <laughs> <laughs> although I never practiced. <laughs> Yeah, there is, I mean, it's so rich with, the, with history. Of course, you know, 1715 was the incorporation of the town, so we're over 300 years old. <laughs> it was, actually, it was a big year for the Historical Society, uh, yeah. helping to celebrate the 300th anniversary. Yeah. Uh, why don't we start with a little bit about uh, the board and the people who run the Historical Society. Uh, what are the offices? Who are the members? Anything you want to tell us about the operation of it from sure. that point of view? Um, I, uh, I've been involved with the Historical Society for about 10 years, mm -hmm. and I've been the, uh, the president of the Historical Society sort of off and on for a number of years. And um, the, uh, the Historical Society was founded in 1951, which is actually much later than most of the surrounding towns. So we were late to the, to the game, but the Historical Society was set up to uh, both celebrate and to preserve the history of the town. And uh, the, it's been made up of uh, both people who sort of grew up here and they have a lot of uh, personal attachment to the town, and also people who just have a uh, real interest in history and especially New England history. So our board uh, is made up of 11 people. Uh, one of those is a curator, so that's someone who's appointed by the board to really be in charge of all of the documents and museum artifacts that we have. Um, and uh, we're like a lot of small organizations in town. We have a membership of about 100, 100 local residents, and uh, the uh, we have uh, four officers and about and a total board of about 11 people. And our officers right now are uh, Ray Gendro, uh, mm -hmm. who's recently moved to Natick, but he's still our vice president. And uh, uh, Tina Berlad is our secretary, and uh, uh, Ron Yankee is our treasurer. Well, hopefully, you said about 100 membership. Uh, so hopefully when people watch the show, it will encourage more people to join as a member because I'm a member myself. And it's a great place to, like you say, uh, collect things from Hopkinton's history, tell stories. There's wonderful programs that go on. So hopefully this show will help incre increase the membership for you. I know when I first moved here, I thought that you needed sort of an invitation, that it was kind of a private club or something oh. like that. But it's really not at all. And, no. and we, we welcome uh, newcomers. and. You know, you don't have to have any particular connection to the town or you don't need to be from Hopkinton. Uh, it's really about people who just have an interest in history. Sometimes people like to just pull out a magnifying glass and look at old photographs and things like that. So it's a really a, a mix of people and, and different kinds of backgrounds um, that are part of the membership. Yeah, and you mentioned it wasn't founded till 1951, uh, which was a very good year, by the way, I can attest to. but. Um, that is a little bit late in terms of historical societies getting started, but the building itself is much older than that. Yes, the building is a whole story uh, unto itself. Um, it was uh, before the historical society bought the building, it was uh, the Grange, the local Grange, which is sort of a farmer's organization. It was the Grange Hall, and before that it was actually a two-room schoolhouse. And if you come to the museum, you'll see that it's, a, it's just a wonderful schoolhouse. It's got tall ceilings and tall windows, and it was built about the time of the Civil War. And uh, you know, I found out that uh, schools in Massachusetts were really leading the nation in terms of architecture and providing uh, fresh air and light and heat for, for students. So the, even the building itself is kind of a, a monument to uh, the interest of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts in education. 
Uh, we, until recently, have had people in town here who went to school there. And so we've interviewed them and we've heard a lot about their memories of, of what happened um, in the schoolroom. But, but today, uh, the room, the building is uh, half of it is a museum and the other half is a, is a meeting room. Mm -hmm. Well, you and the board do a wonderful job at the society. I mean, I can attest to that myself. And um, as you talked about, half of it's a museum. I know that there's a lot of work that's been going on and continues about archiving and, and storing things about our history. Do you want to talk a little bit about that effort and what's happening? Yeah, so the, um, it, it hasn't been until like the last 10 or 15 years that the Historical Society has actually had a building. So mm -hmm. before that, uh, things that were collected, photographs and artifacts sort of moved around between people's attics. Um, and uh, we're really happy that all of these things have now come together in the museum. Um, uh, I should thank the town for really supporting some of the work that was necessary to get a lot of that work started. Um, actually, renovation of the building was um, done with Community Preservation Act funds, and, um, and we also were able to hire um, a professional um, archivist to help us uh, get started with taking all of these things and indexing them in a more computerized way using acid-free boxes and containers and things like that. So we've really tried to learn a lot um, over the last few years about how to organize things. It's been really an interesting education for us, um, and it's really nice to see things being indexed in a way that we can uh, search keywords and things like that on, on a computer. It sounds like a pretty monumental effort to get all that done. It is. So we have a, a number of volunteers. Um, and uh, we also have a, a librarian, a Linda Connolly, who most people know through the library mm -hmm. in Hopkinton, also spends some time at the, our museum helping us uh, continue to, to organize things and make decisions about how things should be stored and indexed. Mm -hmm. So we really appreciate her time. Uh, you also uh, have a number of events that go on during the year as a nonprofit. Some of them are to raise money to keep the society going, and some are for just a lot of fun, because I've been to some of those. Do you want to talk about any of those events that you have? Yeah, we have a couple different kinds of things that happen, and, and I should mention that now our museum has open hours. So that's um, the museum's open from 2 to 5 on Mondays and from 5 to 7 on Thursdays. So anyone can come during that time and, and have a look. Um, the Historical Society has um, different kinds of events. We have programs that are usually open to the public, um, programs of a historical nature where we have speakers come in or mm -hmm. sometimes people will reenact a famous person. Um, it can be all different sorts of things, but those you, and we advertise those in the Hopkinton newspapers and, and places um, and on HCAM so people know that yeah, that's coming around. Um, and we also have some fundraising events to keep the museum going. So. Uh, we've had for many years a harvest supper in the fall. Uh, we have um, a, a large yard sale in the spring. Um, and um, we also have just some social events. So we want people who are members of the Historical Society to have chances to just get together and sometimes in members' homes for mm -hmm. kind of a winter potluck social or something like that. So it's a chance for people to talk about history or just ha have um, some people to talk to who have either memories of the town or want to learn more about the history of the town. It, uh, I've uh, been to some of those events. The yard sale is always fun. I love going over and helping setting up and looking at all the things that come in. And some are of a little historical, you know, perspective, and some are just, you know, housewares and things. But uh, the sale always seems to do pretty well to help bring in some money for uh, the society. And um, I do enjoy those socials; those are always fun too. And the the guest speakers that come in, uh, there's so many people in town. I mean, everybody knows Chuck Joseph. He's he's one that's been there a number of times talking about the history of Hopkinton. I know he really is well versed in that and other guest speakers that have come in talked about Whitehall and you know and other areas so it's a great place to go in and learn about the history and the open hours do you have volunteers now who are there that uh, to staff it so that people can come in and look around and we do we mm -hmm. um, we have a s several people who are there um, almost every time that there's open hours and but then we have other people just drop in 
to take a look or they have, may have specific questions about genealogy and they may ask questions about particular properties or homes to find out if we have any information about that. I mean to keep so the, the building open during those hours there's a volunteer there that greets Yeah there's always a librarian or there or somebody, and, okay. and often uh, at least uh, two or three other volunteers as well. Okay and now that you mentioned historical homes people can go in and find out about historical homes. Did you ever find out information about your own home? You said it was built in 1750? I did, did and I think what I learned from other uh, members of the Historical Society was just how to look these things up and how, where to go to look up deed records or um, uh, old newspaper articles, any, anything that, that, that might be around. And we actually, the Historical Society did have information about my home, so that was very... Uh, it was enlightening, really huh? Fun. Yeah, it was a fun yeah. reading about it and seeing who... Yeah, may have lived there before. Yeah, I mean a lot of things you can learn online now, but but mm -hmm. actually the historical society allowed me to learn about those things and how to access them, and it was very useful. So we have a couple members who are really very good at genealogy and knowing how to track people and, mm -hmm. and families and deaths and births and things like that, and so we do a lot of kind of research for people on those kinds of issues. Well, now you talked about the museum, I mean the, the building, half of it sort of being museum and half of it being meeting place and uh, guest lectures and things. You actually brought some things from the museum part, as I understand, that you'd like to share and share. Yeah, I, 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 if you've never <laughs> been there, I just wanted to give people a sense of some of the kinds of things that we have there. And um, Where would you like to start? How about uh, with this one right here? Um, we have about four boxes of, of these. Um, these are um, um, essays that students wrote in the 1920s and 1930s from Hopkinton. And every year there was a different theme. So this year in 1929, the theme was communication. And what each student contributed was a, a handwritten essay. And you can see there's beautiful handwriting. So that's uh, something from, from years gone by already. Mm -hmm. uh, but they wrote about things that in 1929 were quite innovative, which today we think of as everyday things like the telephone and radio and how people communicate. Um, some of the essays, um, and, and it was just put together very, uh, very nicely. Sometimes there are, there are, there are, um, there's artwork that some students included along with their essays. So here's an example of that. Right here. Yeah, if you can hold that one for a second, yeah. Pretty good from 1929. Yeah, right? I mean, this, at this time, you know, you couldn't just photocopy things and pop it in, right? You had to, to draw something in order to have an illustration along with your essay. And when we look at the names of people, so each one of these is, is <laughs> autographed by the person who did the essay, and we see a lot of familiar last names in here. So there, it's really, uh, so Excuse me. we have about 20 of these one from each year and it's um, they're just great to, to read through just to kind of get a sense of what people were thinking about a very long time ago. Uh, we also have lots of photographs and um, um, you know, from the time of the Civil War on people were taking photographs and I don't know if you can see this well but this is just one I really like it's of uh, a baseball team it's Hopkinton's baseball team about mm. I think this one's 1911 and this one is um, see 1906 and what's really nice about photographs like this is oftentimes people wrote the names of the people on the backs and and this is one of those examples so we know exactly who these people are and we can find out a lot more about them in terms of how they fit into Hopkinton's history um, and also a lot of people uh, nowadays are actually donating to us photographs uh, as digital images. So they have a picture on the wall they don't want to give up but they do want to contribute the actual image to the historical society. And uh, I haven't mentioned this, but actually you know, a big part of the historical society is, is collecting things. So mm -hmm. if people in town have things that they think are really a unique um, photograph or document or artifact around Hopkins history, uh, we, we would love to have donations as well. So clean out, excuse me, clean out those attics and bring those old things yeah, in. <laughs> we've, uh, yeah, unfortunately too many times we just get boxes of things from the attic, but the, the, the best contribution is when somebody has just one thing that's really significant and they, they want to donate that and they have a whole story behind it to mm -hmm. tell. And you have a very interesting object here. Yeah, we also have a lot of um, artifacts, so they're not um, documents or photographs. And I just thought because it's uh, this time of year that uh, 
maybe uh, ice skates would be a, an appropriate thing. So this is what an ice skate looked like. I, I don't know how old this is, but I'm guessing over 100 years. And it had this nasty screw back here that you would screw into your shoe, I guess. And uh, you can see that this is pretty old leather here, leather buckles. And you might go skating on the ice house pond uh, on a very cold day. And uh, we have a lot of things about shoes because Hopkinton's history is very much about shoe factories and leather goods. Now, so is that blade on the bottom wood? Does it look like it's wood? No, or it's, no? Uh, no, no, it's, no, it's uh, okay. steel. It's yeah. steel, yeah. It's steel, but it looks like you'd have to do a lot of soaping and uh, shining to get that to work right. It's pretty old right now, but mm -hmm. that's the case. So we have a lot of things that are like clothing. We have a lot of textiles. Um, um, and we're going through all the process of trying to make sure that those are, are, are um, kept for a very long time in good condition. Well, I mean, you mentioned you can research histor um, the history and historical items and homes and things on the internet, but being able to go into the museum and actually touch that and hold that ice skate, you know, and look at those things in person is a much more, I think, uh, rewarding experience than just reading about it on the internet. Yes, we, we, we think our, the museum's great and uh, we, there's a lot to see there. Uh, we're trying to work on uh, kind of creating more of a, a tour of the museum. So mm -hmm. having posters, having information so that you could have kind of a self tour and learn something about the town by just walking through the uh, museum. So it sounds we like hope a good to have idea. more for children and more, more educational tools as part of the museum. But a lot of our efforts recently have been just about archiving things, getting mm -hmm. things organized, um, and knowing how to, how to find them. Well, you mentioned posters. You've got one here. What is that poster that you've brought with oh, you? Oh, yeah. So this isn't particularly <coughs> old, although it, it was kind of done in an old style. Um, but it's a poster from a Hopkinton Fair, probably in the early 80s or something like that. But this is a uh, museum language. This is called ephemera. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and it, it, it's really valuable, things like this are really valuable to keep in museums. And the reason is because it gives you all sorts of information. It tells you how much it costs per person to go to this carnival. It tells you where it was held, who was the sponsor. So there's a lot of information actually in things like, in things like this. So programs of uh, concerts and things that people go to are, are actually really nice to have as part of the collection too because it, it'll sometimes include names of students who performed in the concert and things like that like that. So it actually is a lot of information that we can collect about the town. Mm -hmm. What are some of the things that, since you've been involved with the historical society, that you've learned about Hockington? Is there any historical perspectives or stories well, it, that you want to share with us? I've learned a lot because I knew very little. So, mm -hmm. is it, uh, And there, I should say that um, uh, even though I've been president of the Historical Society, I'm not one of those people who can just rattle off names and dates and things like, like a lot of others uh, who are members. So, so you'll have to have one of those people back to give you the really good information. But I think um, overall what um, it, it was interesting to me is I, you know, I, I spent a lot of my adult years in Southern California and to come to New England and see how much work uh, goes into local towns um, having their own identity, having their own history, and preserving that history mm -hmm. is pretty remarkable. And Hopkinton has a lot of unusual uh, aspects of its history. Uh, for a period, it was really owned by Harvard College. Uh, before the, lease, the leasehold farmers were able to get support from the state to buy it out, um, it was um, one of the uh, praying Indian towns. So it was one of the, the towns on the outskirts of the Boston area where uh, native tribes were unfortunately uh, forced to adopt uh, English language and customs mm -hmm. and um, and they kind of lived as as uh, as uh, e English um, uh, tribes out here and in, 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 until they were some went on west but some stuck around and the, and the, so so Hopkinton was one of the praying Indian towns um, that was established by John Eliot who was a, a, a Reverend Elliot. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, Reverend Elliot, yeah. And if you drive around Hopkinton, you'll see a lot of names that then come up in, in Hopkinton history as well. Um, so, and it's, uh, you know, Hopkinton was a pretty industrial town uh, about the time of the Civil War. So there, was, there were factories. Um, then during the uh, first half of the 20th century, really Hopkinton was, 
was uh, a very quiet town. And if you look around town, you see almost no buildings or homes that were built during that time. Uh, and it wasn't until after World War II when, that things began to pick up again, and even more so when uh, the 495 corridor really became a place to work. And uh, so, so Hopkins is changing a lot, but that's part of understanding history to really kind of track the changes and, and record them and uh, be a resource for people in the future. I know uh, some of the things that I learned from the Historical Society about Hopkinton was, as you said, it was used to, uh, land was owned by Harvard College, and then, you know, in 1715 we got incorporated. But at one point in time, it was, Hopkinton had part of Ashland and Holliston in that land area uh, in the, before they broke off and became towns of their own, and when, you know, when they, we incorporated, and I think it was $10,000, they said, for $10,000, the land was bought from Harvard College, and uh, 2000 of that was put up by residents, and the other 8000 I forget exactly where it came from, some grant from, or something. From the state. Yeah. I don't, I don't know yeah, exactly so. how they made those decisions, but they must have thought it was a good thing to have people owning their own land so yeah but I thought that was pretty amazing for ten thousand dollars we got all this acreage I mean of course back then it might have now. been you know a lot of seemed like a lot of money but yeah so a lot of interesting things and uh, the people of course too you say the you know, genealogy and some of the families that are involved in the history and uh, some of those folks that went on to do some important things, inventions and whatnot. I, I'm not going to give away any of the secrets because I want people to go down to the society and check it out. We have, um, we're especially proud of two things that we have in the museum recently. Uh, we have an arrangement with the Claflin Family Association. So the, there was a Claflin who was the governor and, mm -hmm. and his family was very influential. In, uh, in Massachusetts, and uh, they are storing uh, their, their family artifacts in the museum. So we have an agreement with them to do that, mm -hmm. and we can access those materials. And then recently, uh, just in the past year, we were, um, and we were contacted by um, a descendant of Elijah Fitch. So Elijah Fitch was a very influential local leader who lived in the Elmwood Farm, which has been oh. recently purchased in, mm -hmm. on Ash Street. And, um, and it's just amazing things. Um, the family was very tight, uh, was a relation of the family was Nathaniel Howe, who was also a very famous uh, minister from Hopkinton, and uh, wrote a very famous thing called the Sermon of the Century that was translated into many languages and kind of went viral back and then. And I think and he was part of the <coughs> same Howe family. One of the Howe brothers or something founded what is now Wayside Inn. That's right, there was and a family connection. another one invented a, um, the sewing machine or something, I was reading, there was a lot of uh, creativity in the Howe family there. Yeah, yeah it's am and what's amazing about the family is that they kept all of these things for many generations, and so we were so happy that, so he donated boxes and boxes of old writings of Nathaniel Howe, some of his, some of his books that he used every day, his, even his desk uh, where he sat to, to write things. So. Um, it's, it's just a wonderful collection of, of things from, that actually came from Hopkinton, so mm -hmm. it has a really unique uh, local um, connection. Well, with all of these things that are coming into the museum, I mean, do you foresee at some point we need more space? Uh, how is that building going to hold everything that, you know, and plus be able to have meetings and presentations and... Well, that's one of the things the board there, talks it? about a lot. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the things that we've learned is that, you know, you put photographs, you put historical things in boxes, not really in filing cabinets. So mm -hmm. it does take up a lot of space. We, we see, it feels like every year we buy uh, some more shelving, and so we keep adding to that. But um, when I go visit other historical sites, we actually have a whole lot more square footage than most do. So, mm -hmm. you know, for the average historical site, you're kind of sandwiched into the basement of the town hall or something like that. So we actually have a lot of space. So. I'm not too worried yet, and uh, we, have, we, have, we have some basement space, but we don't really want to put anything val of any value there. Um, but we, um, we just keep adding shelves, and I think we have plenty of room. If you think about a library and just having racks and racks of things, we have okay. plenty of space to do that um, in, the, in the, the building. And we're just really happy that we have this building to um, be able to put these things all in one place. So not really thinking about building out back some more space or anything. We're just going to leave it the way it no, is for now. No, I think huh? we've actually got plenty. I think it's just adding shelves and uh, making wise use of that. Uh, we have, um, uh, there was a jewelry store in town, I think, that, that 
uh, closed and they gave us these just beautiful uh, showcases, display cases that we use to display things and we, we keep trying to uh, um, rotate things through there. So, you, so there are things to look at when you go there besides a bunch of boxes and, and we're trying to continue to make it more of an educational place where you can read, read about things on the walls and, and learn a little bit about the town's yeah. history. Well I know you have the wonderful display cases and there's some old furniture. I mean I've seen some of the things that are there. They're just wonderful and I um, was going to ask if some of the things that are down in the basement they periodically get rotated upstairs for viewing and and you change we do have, it out a little bit or we're working on that we have um, we're going to take a little we have a little alcove space that I think we're going to make into a, a permanent display area so the larger things can be displayed mm -hmm. so for example we have a we have a spinning wheel which is huge and like you know you can't just sort of oh, plop no. that down in the middle of the room you, know, you can try to hang it on the wall or you can yeah, keep it in the basement and, and then rotate it out for special occasions and things like that. And we have a couple other things like that are just too large to be able to have on display all the time. Uh, we have a model of a bill of, of a, a building that's just huge that someone spent so much time building mm -hmm. and uh, we, we, we like having it but we can't have it out all the time. So we do have some things hidden away in the base. Before we want to run out of time I wanted to ask you about membership too because we'd like to increase the membership there and how does one go about becoming a member and how much is it? to join as a member. Um, uh, it's very reasonable. Yeah, it's uh, $20 <laughs> um, for, a, for an individual and $30 mm -hmm. for a family for an uh, annual membership. Um, and family is two or more, so yeah, it's a yeah. real bargain. <laughs> and so it doesn't cost a lot and it helps to support the museum. Um, and we have newsletters and other kinds of information that we try to give to members. Um, and. Uh, we, uh, we, so we encourage membership and we also encourage donations. So if you have um, things you'd like to, that you think are worthy of being um, stored and archived in the museum, uh, please let us, please contact us through our website. Yeah, we will put that at the bottom of the screen okay. during the show, yeah. We have a website and a local phone number and we check messages frequently. So please, uh, anyone who would like to learn more about membership or about the museum or about the historical society, we'd really be, glad to um, talk with you. Yeah, And they can just go out to the website and uh, click on the membership item that's out there. Yeah, there's a, it. it'll give you a membership sheet that you can just mail into the Historical Society. Mm -hmm. yep. all, good, all good information. Thank you. If you'd like to hear more information about the Hopkinton Historical Society, visit their website located on the screen below. For everyone here at HCAM, I'm Mary Arnott. Thank you for watching this episode of All About Hopkinton with Bill Shaw. Thank you very much, Bill. It was very interesting. Thank you for having me.